Okay, so this is also a costume I was very proud of because of the uh, creativity. Mm-hmm. I thought, like, I actually sewed, I sewed, like, two little oval things onto a skirt. But wow. I sewed it. I know. Yes. I know. No. So I was Mickey Mouse, right? Mm-hmm. But I was, uh, and then this is the first and last unironic sexy costume right. I ever did. And we'll get there. We'll get yeah, there. Yeah, we'll get We're there. We're saving it. <laughs> Burying the lead. I wanted to start Wonderful this conversation job. with that, but we are, I'm holding back. <clears throat> great job. Great job. Uh, so I was Mickey Mouse, yeah. right? And This is still pretty weird. You were sexy Mickey Mouse? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think here's how it happened. So I was like, um, you know, oh, having- boy. <laughs> What made me the most mad is everybody thought I was a mi- I was Minnie Mouse just because I was a girl and I was yeah. like fuck all You're of y'all. Like Mickey can be sexy too, right? Do you not see the the red the white ovals on the the skirt that I'd made? This was my first unironically sexy costume, and then there was another one. Um, but I think I all, I chose them all based on like how can my hair be incorporated mm-hmm. in this? Mm-hmm. So with Mickey Mouse, I was like, well, I can do like two big curly Afro puffs, and those will be my ears. I had just like a very like plain basic black long sleeve t shirt because it was cold that year. Um, cleavage, obviously, because how else will anyone know that I'm a sexy version of the right. thing that I am? I found like a red mini skirt. And you know, he's got the two little white ovals for like the overall buttons or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got some white felt uh-huh. and I sewed the little ovals on and I was like, I'm Martha Stewart now. You can't tell me yeah. anything. Then. Fishnets, because of course, mm-hmm. you're not sexy mm-hmm. unless you have the fishnets. Mm-hmm. And then I went and I got some really cheap, um, like hugely tall platform heels. And I spray painted them yellow because his shoes are yellow. That's tricky. Right? That's tricky. I was so proud. And I, I had like the little good. tail. Um, crowning glory is that, yes, I was Mickey Mouse, but colloquially I was known as Thicky Mouse. <laughs> I was like, I'm a genius. <laughs> Nothing will be better than this ever. This is Mad Chat, a podcast where we unpack what our pop culture is telling us about madness and mental health. I'm your host, Sandy Allen, and today I am so freaking excited about (laughs) my guest, the one and only, the God, Tracy Clayton, (gasps) is here to talk about, honestly, kind of like the most problematic fave holiday, in my opinion, Halloween. Yep, it's a doozy. (laughs) Tracy, (laughs) welcome to Mad Chat. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very pleased that you agreed to do this. So Halloween has been kind of like one of the big focus points that I've thought about again and again and again as I've thought about mental health, how people learn about mental health, kind of all the messages that we're picking up on various TV shows and in movies or kind of like in the discourse around this celebrity or that celebrity or, or you know, and, and Halloween is kind of one of those it, it, it comes up again and again and again that I see horror stuff, haunted houses, mm-hmm. uh, you know, scary movies, costumes, amusement parks, anything in that realm that is taking up psych patients, you know, um, yeah. uh, psych uh, <laughs> like treatments like, you know, electroshock machines or straight jackets and sort of the real, it seems like joy that a <laughs> lot of people get from kind of taking psychiatric related imagery and making it into something scary. Yes. It's yes. just this this thing that because I'm kind of tuned into like whatever frequency I'm tuned into here where I would just paid attention to like schizophrenia for a lot of years and, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, Halloween is this over and over and over, it seems like a very common thing is just kind of taking up these topics, which I think should not be treated as horror tropes and really Mm -hmm. just happily doing that. And I've not noticed uh, a real cultural recognition of that fact. You know, there's been, as far as I can tell, very little pushback Mm -hmm. if someone wants to really lean heavily on a sort of like underlying idea that 
oh, a psych patient is a monster, for right. example, or a psych treatment is a sort of torture or, you know. So it, it did make me think, and we were just talking about this, about Halloween in general, mm-hmm. what it is. <laughs> um, what, and so that's kind of where I want to start is just thinking about Halloween and 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 uh, what's your relationship with Halloween? Like when you were a little kid, did you look forward to this holiday or did you like kind of hate that everybody had to dress up to beg for candy? <laughs> Um, I've never thought of it about dressing up and begging for candy. I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, that's, yeah, that, to kids, that's they're worrying. like, hey, this is your job. You have very <laughs> few jobs, but there's one. You got to yeah. dress up. And if you don't do it well, you don't get any candy. No. You're what? Gonna... A, you know what? Partially a shitty holiday. Am I, mean, I allowed to say shitty? Can we go oh, some? yes. Okay. Please say all the swears. Okay. <laughs> Fuck Halloween. Fuck okay. making your kids beg for stuff. That being said, yeah. I did enjoy looking forward to going to beg for candy mm. in the streets. But also as a kid, um, no one knew this then. And I guess I technically don't know that I came out of the womb with anxiety disorder. I'm mm. assuming so. Mm. <laughs> like looking back, there's the a world lot of things. probably that, helped like, too. I'm certain. Yeah. I'm certain it had a hand mm-hmm. in that. Um, but, you know, I was scared of a lot of stuff. Mm. Um, and I was also... Raised in a house where, um, you know, holidays, fun stuff, you know, like we we did those things if me and my brother and like my friends had an interest in them, which, of course, we always did because like, it's a holiday. You get to dress up yeah. and be like the people on TV. But the thing that I hated about Halloween was like the the really gruesome like masks and like the werewolves with the, the fangs dripping blood and stuff like that's not that's not fun. Scary stuff. It was terrifying yeah. stuff. And I also grew up in a household where my family um, love them. I don't say this to be a negative thing. It just kind of is what it is. Your family do listen to this show for I'm sure. sure. At li- do not put it past my mother. <laughs> I think she's got Fair. a Google alert out there. Because she'd be like, so what was this thing the other they day? They told like, moms about Google alerts? That's terrible. I know. When I find out who did it, <laughs> we're going to have some words. Um, but um, they're jerks. Like, in a in a in an acerbic, you know, I'm teasing you kind of way, Mm-mm. which has helped me in the long run because um, when I do have the confidence to be like, oh my gosh, I'm so witty and so quick, like I had to be because to not cry in the house every day with really funny, witty, acerbic trolls, yeah, I had to, yeah, you know, so steel yeah. sharpened steel in that respect, yeah. But and this is the thing I've been thinking about recently. There's also that dynamic of, um, you know, they tease because it's fun to them. They tease because there's some of them like, "Uh uh-huh, I got you upset, like whatever that dynamic is. Yeah. But then they would do the thing like when I get upset and they start to feel bad for having made me upset. Yeah. Oh, you're so sensitive. Why are you so sensitive? Oh, yeah. And I'm, do you know how disorienting that is for a child? Yeah. Like you're putting, you're punishing me for feeling the way that you just made me feel. Like, I asked you to stop several times. I told you it's not funny, you know? And, like, now I feel bad for having feelings and emotions and being afraid of these things. And my most specific memory of this as it relates to Halloween is my brother, my big brother. He's eight years older than me. Um, One of the funniest and smartest people I know. Also, just one of the biggest jerks. Like, (laughs) you know what? I halfway hope he hears this one day. Because I've been talking about this in therapy. So, like, some stuff has been, like, coming to light. But, I mean, like, it really messes with, like, your ability to trust people with your emotions and your safety. So, he would tease a lot. Not just me. Like, there's kind of a time limit at family functions. Like, okay, Trav's good for maybe an hour on a good day. Mm. And then everybody's like, all right. I got you got to go or I got to go or we got to start drinking, you know. <laughs> um, but so he teased me all the time, um, especially during Halloween. And there was this one Halloween where I was um, I think Halloween was, was like over, you know, like I went out, I was trick or treating mm-hmm. and um, I'm in my living room, minding my black ass business. I got my candy. I'm watching some yeah. like happy Halloween movies. Yeah. And here comes my brother in the dark with one of those like horrible masks on. And the thing is, the mask was in my house because some other random little boys on the street were teasing me with it. And I didn't like it and it made me cry. So here I am in my house safe. My brother finds the mask and he's just like walking up really slowly. And even though I can hear his giggle, he has a really like weird high pitched like... (laughs) 
get, when he's doing some <laughs> some horrible shit. So I know it's him, but I was just frozen and I couldn't do anything. And I was like, if I can't move, I'm going to die. It, I know it's not a real werewolf, but maybe it is. I don't know. And like, that's one of those memories that just like sticks to me when it comes to Halloween. And I am not one of those people who enjoys fear. No, I don't either. Possibly because I wake up with fear every day. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you and I have the same diagnosis. Yeah. So I, you know? I identify with a lot of that. And I think that sense of like not wanting to court fear of like right. one time I went to a Halloween like house, like a haunted house as Same. an adult uh -huh. with my friends in Iowa. And they were like, what's wrong with you? You've never been to a haunted house? And I was like, why would I ever go to something like this? And we went to a haunted house and I was so scared. It's I, awful. I was not doing well. I was having a bad time. I was, right. I was holding on to my friend so hard. Mm -hmm. I was hurting her yeah. and, and, and everyone thought it was funny. And I was like, there's nothing funny about the fear worst. to me. It, there's not, it's yeah. not enjoyable. It's not a thing. And I have a friend who, I swear, <laughs> I love her so much. Her name is Janelle. Janelle is the biggest, just like Halloween, just fan to a degree where I'm like, you know, you're an adult. I don't know that you should be taking a week off of Halloween <laughs> to watch your favorite Halloween movies. I respect and like, you that. Know, so do I. <laughs> but I just think it's so interesting, like her connection to this thing, yeah. like of all the things to feel like comforted by, like it's the scary did you season. did you like the dressing up part of halloween would mm -hmm. you like go to school wearing a costume or like go out trick-or-treating wearing a costume do you have uh -huh. a favorite costume that sort of like sticks out in your mind <laughs> so i did like to dress up <laughs> we were not always the most original and i think that my mom basically i was the same thing for several years in a row okay because it's like you know what vampire work last year <laughs> we still got some fake blood this Good. year you like vampires yeah. it's fine and i did you know like vampires were like one of the things where it was just like well you know i'm fairly sure they don't exist in real life um so i can enjoy them okay yeah. um but other than werewolves that, less so nah yeah <laughs> i don't know why <laughs> i see the delineation that's been drawn you know? there oh yeah and it could be like I was always into the lore more so than like the actual vampires. And mm -hmm. I loved um, Bram Stoker's Strokers. Stokers. <laughs> the, the Dracula. That guy. The, the, yeah, the, that, that Dracula yeah. movie, you know, yeah. and like the a vampire can't come in unless, you know, you invite them in and they don't have like a reflection. Like that was the stuff that was interesting to me. So you were a vampire? Yes. Um, at least one year I was a high school graduate because my brother had graduated high school and had the cap and gown. I love this. And my mom was like, oh, don't you want to be a graduate? And I was like, yeah, How old someday. are you? I was like, may, I was not in double digit ages yet. So yeah. Like elementary seven school. seven and nine. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so that was a couple of years. Oh, I I'm think. sure adults love that. Easy peasy. That and seems like, like you I'm just getting more use out of this. You'd be yes. like, look at me here mm -hmm. with my future college. I have dreams and ambitions. <laughs> here, have more sugar. Exactly. <laughs> Take the sugar. <laughs> oh, America. Um, but I would like to confess because I do feel like this is a safe space. Um, this is way back when I didn't know any better. Um, assuming that no, well, clearly no one knew any better because this was my costume for possibly the longest run. This was my costume again because it was easy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I <laughs> God, I'm so excited. <laughs> I don't even know. I have no idea what you're going to say. I was um, the what was then known and now known as and frowned upon as a hobo, quote ah. unquote. And I was that because I had uncles. Yeah, yeah, Big yeah. old clothes, you know. Um, I had like a, a Sprite bottle and like a brown paper bag. This is like a costume trope. I think this is like yeah. a thing. That kids, is it, in E.T., Does isn't there a kid who dresses up like a hobo? I think it made oh, an impression know. on me as a kid. I was yeah. like, that's a thing. Hmm. Um, I think E.T. might have scared me as a kid. Oh, so well, I don't it's remember. terrifying. He was scary. That's was a like... really scary movie. <laughs> I, I mean, I regard a lot of movies that I don't think are technically scary movies as very uh -huh. scary. But I mean, he <clears> kind of looked like a a toe mixed with a loaf of bread and he was just talking to people and they was cool with this like cool. <laughs> lots didn't make sense to me nobody explained uh, anything i was like i think i'm all right so this hobo costume it's mm -hmm. definitely one of those things that you look back on and go like uh yeah it's kind of yeah you know yeah. um i remember i was given like the five o'clock shadow with charcoal mm -hmm. and um i do remember i remember feeling proud 
about the costume, or at least its quality, because everybody thought that I was a little boy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, ha ha, mm-hmm. we did it. We hooked it up. Yeah. And then I remember. Gender is um, an easy scam. It takes isn't it? very little. Yeah. <laughs> Facial hair. Yeah. Oh. People are like, oh. I know. I don't know how you're 12 years old and you've managed the to grow. man is here. Facial hair by now. But, you know, easy peasy. Um, so I say all that to say I did enjoy the dressing up parts. I did enjoy going out to get candy because I liked candy. Was also terrified of all of the horror stories about, you know, people are going to put razor blades in yeah. your apples. And first I was like, who's giving out apples for yeah. Halloween? Yeah. Because the rest That's of them are crime. Already, you, can, <laughs> you should not be able to do that. No. But like, I don't know if this was a thing where you grew up. I grew up in um, Louisville, Kentucky, which nobody would think of as being like urban or like, you know, but it, it was the hood. We're on the first 48 now. So it was a true crime show. It was really terrible. Uh, shout out to Louisville. Um, but like there were all these rumors about like, you know, there's an evil clown, you know, and they like live around the corner and like they come out and they like kidnap kids and you got to be careful and don't go out alone and blah, blah, blah. So I'm simultaneously out living my future dream as a graduate, just mm-hmm. trying to get some candy. Slash hobo. Slash hobo, <laughs> slash vampire. And I'm also <laughs> expecting to be murdered kind of, you yeah. know? And it was just a very strange and confusing it was a confusing time because I there were so much there was stuff that I enjoyed about it, but possibly more that I did not enjoy about it. Yeah, it could be stressful. I feel like Halloween yeah. for I feel like for kids, it's a very high pressure, you know, sort of it, it it, like the costumes can, I think, get very competitive or yeah. I mean, I just remember as a kid going to elementary school, kind of like you have your costume. I mean, and I was always kind of making up really weird things that weren't <laughs> costumes. Like one year I was a jogging dog in third grade. I was wearing a jogging outfit and a dog mask. Wait. Like what? What is that? Like, why didn't anybody be like, that's not a thing? Like, (laughs) (laughs) where do we get a jogging outfit? You know, the the questions that one has now looking back. Was this your idea? No idea. (laughs) No idea. I'm going to guess not. I think I was like maybe seven or eight. And I think it was maybe like there was a dog mask, but not really like the remainder of the Uh dog costume. So Uh it was like, well, here. Creativity. Yeah, we'll just do a little spin on it. So I would say, like, none of the things that it was for Halloween were ever very scrutable. I don't mm, think I was ever anything that an adult was like, oh, I can tell what this uh-huh. is. And I think that's true of all my <laughs> Halloween costumes, including yeah. as an adult. I think for me especially so as an adult. <clears throat> yeah, so <laughs> we we met working at BuzzFeed. One of the things about working at BuzzFeed that was, I think, unusual was that it was a place where on Halloween – there was an incredible amount of Halloween costume. Yeah. Just, I mean, I don't even know Serious how to explain Halloween it. Costume. Like, because there's such creative people. Mm-hmm. I mean, and this was a few years ago. So yeah. n- now who knows? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean I've got some theories, yeah. but that's another show. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it was just like such fabulously creative people. Also very young people. Yes. And who some of whom had clearly put in like way too much time. I mean, that was, I think, what would stress me out because yeah. you'd get to work and you'd be like, oh, I've, I, I did it. But, you know, not no, like no, these no. folks, <laughs> these folks did it. You yeah. know, like, where did you, you like build a thing? You're like, yeah. you know, we, how did you learn to do monster makeup? But I remember you because Aww. you had, I think, well, you had a few very iconic costumes. Oh Your prince costume. <laughs> Like, it was wonderful. Like, I guess, do you want to tell us about how that costume team came together and just, like, what it's been like for you as an adult to Mm -hmm. kind of, like, I don't know, change your relationship with Halloween a little bit or kind of, like, make it something that you are just, like, looking forward to? Yeah. So, as I get older and I'm like, oh, first of all, I should not be a hobo anymore ever. And also, I don't have to be, like, a scary thing and, like, Halloween can be whatever I want it to be. I was just like, okay, I do, I do enjoy, like, being creative and making things and taking like um I don't know something that's just like normal or ordinary or whatever and just like kind of doing it in a different way I also really enjoy just being cute on Halloween Mm. (laughs) so I was like how what costume would allow me (laughs) to do all these things that I love wait did you ever go through like a sexy like a not an ironic sexy phase but Mm -hmm. like uh were you ever like in your I don't know, late teens, early 20s, 20s, and kind of just be like, oh, I'm a sexy ladybug. Did you ever have Um, like that? I'm a sexy angel. (laughs) 
Um, I was a sexy Marge Simpson. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I had like, you know, those foam, <laughs> when you had to make like the solar system mm-hmm. projects, the little mm-hmm. foam balls, I mm-hmm. took some of those and like put them on my head somehow and like pinned the rest of my hair over it, <laughs> which I felt like a genius then. But then I saw the pictures and I was like, I just look a mess. <laughs> I just look confusing and just, you know. Halloween is, I think <clears throat> part of it is that like that illusion almost that I feel like gets created even when someone's not really doing a costume well. It's like yeah. when anyone can be like, oh, that's what you are. That's so yeah. cool. And that, yeah. that feeling of like right. people. I also, I do like, and this is kind of back to the BuzzFeed thing. I do like that it can bring out the side of people that's like super weird yeah. or, you know, super specific or like someone kind of like really reveals something about mm-hmm. them, you know, in a choice that they've made. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is no single Halloween costume that I feel like has made more of an impression on me in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that I feel like I wanted to talk to you about Halloween kind of more than anyone else on earth. Um, uh, I've seen this costume, I think in a few different contexts, actually. I mm. feel like, but the the, the sexy Steve Harvey, <laughs> I think really changed <laughs> like culture um, really i think so Please tell me more. Uh, <laughs> uh it brings me so much joy still um why don't you just like talk me through how this came about because i mean i think like kind of uh deep stalking you on twitter in terms of your your uh your tweet about this it seemed like you had actually been uh wanting to do this costume for some years before it actually came about like mm-hmm. it was really um like you built toward it. It was in the making. Mm-hmm. It was several years in the making. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I got older and as I became more learned a person, um, I really came to resent how people really started to criticize people who enjoyed being sexy versions of like whatever yeah. else. And I'm just like, well, you know, we can't do this any other day of the year because we get shamed for it. Yeah. We get assaulted for it. We yeah. get whatever. Let us have this day. Yeah. You know, let us wear what we want, display our bodies as we want in the name of it being a joke, if nothing else. Um, and so then I was just like, you know what? I'm very pro slutty costume, sexy costume, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I also like funny things. And it's, you know, a, a sexy angel is like, yay, you did it. You're allowed to do it. But I'm just like, you know, I just want it. If I'm going to continue with the sexy costume thing, I want it to be a completely needless thing yeah. that should not be sexy at all. Yeah. That already is not sexy. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you had feelings about sexy oh. before your oh. face. <laughs> oh. um, sidebar. Have you seen the pictures of him shirtless and oiled up? <laughs> okay. No. Okay. We have to talk about that later because there is a better <laughs> sexy Steve Harvey costume out there than mine. Oh, wow. I know, right? Oh, I, wow. I know. <laughs> I know. So, so surprising. <laughs> I will give credit where credit is well, due, though. I want, but give yours credit. Right. You, describe yes. to the people in case there's anyone who never saw this costume mm-hmm. or photos of this costume. Like, what, what, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I'm being asked to confess yes. to a crime. <laughs> well, <laughs> so um, I had played a version of Steve Harvey, do a really awful impression of Steve Harvey that I love because it's purposefully right. awful. and that's probably what i'm remembering i'm like i remember yeah. i remember another round live show mm-hmm. where that character came out and yeah. I th- it was like at the bell house or something it was at the and bell i think house. it was one of those things where it was like the whole show was so completely <laughs> kidnapped by that character because it, it was so absurd like now that you were on stage as this character like it was like a, a rift in the time space continuum <laughs> like just like Somebody everything would be like pulled into zero. the gravity of it it was so marvelous it was a lot and it was a lot because it was so bad like i have all this hair Steve Harvey is bald. Yeah. We had ordered like the little bald cap things. Tried to get brown. It was green for some reason. We didn't understand that you had to have like makeup to make it stay on your head. So we just ended up putting my hair in a ponytail. And it was it's like a, a green deflated cone heads head. Yeah. And I've got this mustache and I'm inhaling the fibers and it was just ridiculous. <laughs> And I was like, what is the most ridiculous thing that I know kind of like how to create? That doesn't need to be a sexy anything. And I mean, I had the Steve Harvey um, suit, which was just like uh, just like a 
man suit from mm-hmm. like Ross or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had that and I was like, okay, how do you mm-hmm. make Steve Harvey sexy? Mm-hmm. How do you do it? Mm-hmm. So um, I just went to, again to like some little like store down the street in Flatbush. I got a gray mini skirt. I already had the fishnets <laughs> from Thicky Mouse years ago. Yes, I kept them <laughs> just in case. And um, they were like, we're here. I know. Waiting. Finally. <laughs> you want to be a sexy again? <laughs> My moment is back. <laughs> Um, and just like, I think random, random, like high heel shoes or whatever. I would but- watch the Pixar about, <laughs> <laughs> about the pair of fishnets in the closet. <laughs> and we wore sexy Marge. <laughs> and then, and then, oh, but now it's like, someday. she doesn't love us anymore. <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin song. <laughs> in the <old. laughs> Um, <sighs> would also watch that. So the thing that really got it for me was, you know, is the accessories and like the other touches that like are going to drive home that I am Steve Harvey and yeah. not just somebody's uncle in mm-hmm. a sexy uncle, somebody's right. sexy and inappropriate Classic uncle. costume. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Perhaps Suddenly, an idea. Uh, <laughs> it is October. <laughs> it is. It do you is. have an idea already for this year? I do. Okay. I is do. it already like? Um, is it already with you? Like, have you have you realized it? We've got like some weeks left as we record here. Yeah. You know what I do every year is I've got this great idea and I've got months to get it together. Right. And the week before I'm like, oh, shit, I have to be Whitney Houston tomorrow. How oh, yeah, yeah, it? yeah. You know? <laughs> so that's kind of where I am now. I've got great <laughs> ideas just procrastinating until it happens. Yeah, that's how you do it. That's it. I mean, well, apparently not for some of the people we used to work with, because yeah. that's what would really surprise me. I would be like, yeah, you like put time into this. It felt like after the because there was a cost, uh, a, costume a contest, contest, right? Like yeah. after the winners were announced, it's like everybody was like, OK, let's get started on next year. You know? And I was like, I don't want to breathe. I'm for like, a it's second. October again. Really? Why? <laughs> Um, so the the touches on the sexy yes. Steve Harvey costume, yes, um, the mustache which I had already had from yeah. being Steve Harvey in the live shows. Um, I went out and I bought this really big exaggerated microphone with mm-hmm. like a big glittery microphone top. I don't know what to, I should know what it's called. I work in audio. Micro- but you know. Microphone. Yeah, I think I don't they're know. called microphone. <laughs> I'll call that a microphone. Let's go with that. Yeah, we'll fact check. Probably later. has a better name. <laughs> Mic top. Mike Top. I like Mike Top. Um, I printed out like some family feud cards Mm -hmm. or I already had them. Um, And then I was like, well, my hair, what do I do for my hair? Mm -hmm. Um, And what I decided to do was um, I wanted to slick it back as much as possible, which I have a big head for one. So there's a lot of hair up there. And also like it's very textured. It's very, very curly. So like I had to I had to do a practice run of my hair like the week before because I was like, if I can't get the hair right, it's not going to work because I lost the the green bald cap. Oh, yeah. I was like, we, I thought we solved this. Yeah. yeah. Me too. We were like, it was not great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it was a solve. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It worked then. Yes. So what I did was I slicked it back as much as I could, like so much gel and like tied it down. So it was just like very, very slick. And I just got two... Um, wig caps I think they're called but like mm-hmm. the stockings that you mm-hmm. put on I found some that were quote unquote flesh toned mm-hmm. and my winter color was just about the same color and mm-hmm. I was like you know what there's no sense in letting this outfit go to waste I'm just gonna put on about two or three wig caps yeah <laughs> and yeah. this is it but the effect was very clear it was sexy right. Steve Harvey it, it it read immediately it did what it needed to do I went to um I think Franklin Park that night and mm-hmm. the crazy wait I remember an anxiety attack that night well that's what I was gonna ask I wanted to uh bring up this tweet because I thought it was a good encapsulation of something that I think you have done well in a variety of media, whether it was, you know, another round or your work on BuzzFeed more generally, or just, you know, your work on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You said, I'm curious if you're comfortable doing so, post a picture of you that you shared on social media where you were actually having a really tough time in life, even though you look perfectly fine in the picture. And then you had a shot of yourself as sexy sexy Steve Harvey. And you said, last Halloween, I debuted my best costume ever. (laughs) I had two Two big anxiety attacks before coming to the point of taking this pic and my chest was tight all night. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that I, I'm just remembering that. Um, I can't remember exactly what happened. I know that one of them was because 
something was not going right. Yeah. And I want to say that it was in relation to the costume. And I probably had worried myself since I waited to the last minute. Mm. I had probably like worried myself, like, I got to get this. I got to get that. And I got to go to Midtown to do this. And I got to do all of that. And I don't like going places outside. And rah, rah, rah. Yeah. And so. Outside's the worst. Why do we have to why do Why do that? we have to go there? The internet exists. I know. I think we can fix this. Case later. closed. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Um, so that happened and like, yeah, I remember, I remember that I had like gotten it together. I was going out to meet some friends, like maybe three or four friends. And, um, another friend of mine was going to be, um, he was Bruno Mars. He was the best Bruno Mars he could be. Bless his heart. He did what he could. Um, <laughs> and we both live in Flatbush. So like, he was kind of like helping me. I'm just like, you know, it's not going right, but blah, 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 blah. But I had been so proud of like pushing through it and like, mm. I've got my costume together and we are in the Uber and we're going to Franklin Park. I remember we were going to. And I had forgotten something. Mm. It was either like the card or the microphone or something. And I was just like, after what I just went through, I'm going to have my whole costume. And that's it. Or I'm just going to like collapse and cry all night. And he was like, well, you know, I don't think that anybody else would care. You know, they've been waiting for a while already. And I was like, I understand, but I can't explain it. Like, I just, I got to go back and get it. And I was like, you go ahead, y'all have fun, take all the pictures, get everyone drunk on my behalf. But I was just like, I just have to do this. And I went back home and I was just like, I can't believe I went all the way back home to get these family feud cards. Why am I like this? It's so tough. But now, and at that point I was like, I don't want to leave again. Yeah. But I was like, my friends are out there and I got to go. So I did it. I went out and I hemmed it up as best I could. And Mm -hmm. I went home and probably collapsed because I don't think I got as drunk as I wanted to that Mm -hmm. night. So I probably went home and just kind of like fell apart. But I think that's part of just like what, um, like it's, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. Like if I can push through an anxiety thing, mm. not being able to push through it again or another anxiety thing makes me feel like a failure, mm. I think. And it was just like, okay, do I want to stay home and have a tight chest or do I go out with my friends who are coming out like because I like Halloween more than anybody else does, you know? So it was tough. And I was like, well, I got to take these pictures. And, you know, because I, people need to see the costume. Right. Um, and I, I did it. I managed it. But I, I felt shitty. Isn't that something? The <laughs> and then you when you made the decision to kind of like reveal that, like mm-hmm. when you decided to be like, hey, this is actually what was going on here. Do you remember kind of like what you were thinking about or maybe just more generally, like how do you think about when to share of yourself in this way? Like how do you mm. navigate that? How have you kind of built up? Because um, I, I think this is probably something that you figured out how to do over time in mm. terms of being honest about some of what you're going through as a way of, I mean, it helps to some degree. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, recently... I've noticed that when I do when I do share a lot or when I ask people to share with me or invite people to share with right. me, it's honestly because I'm struggling and it helps me in my own healing to know that I'm not alone Yeah. or that whatever I'm going through is helpful to somebody, you mm-hmm. know, like something good has to come out of this somewhere. Mm-hmm. I feel like now that I'm like crawling out of the crypt that is my depressive disorder, which mm-hmm. was a fun gift that the universe mm-hmm. thought I needed a few years ago, um, I do think more about what I share and what I don't. Like mm-hmm. I, I never like shared anything because I felt like I had to. But now I'm just like, you know what? You you don't have to share this and it'll be fine. You know, like you don't have to share so much. Right. Because there are times I think where I'm just like, oh, this is a good idea. I should tweet it. It might help somebody. It might help me. But I'm also like, you don't have to. Yeah. You know, so that's a thing that I'm learning to like sort of suss out now. But um, nine times out of 10, I'm going through some shit and I'm just like, am I the only one? Can somebody else relate? Is this just happening to me? How do I like, how do I get out of focusing on my own like, I don't know, pain or issue or frustration. In that particular post, I didn't expect it to get as big as it did at all. Yeah, a lot of people really yeah. responded to yeah. this call for, like, photos where you're not as happy as you look. Yeah, and, like, people were so, like, so candid. Yes. Like, a lot of stuff I was just, like, I wanted to reach out and be like, you know, you didn't have to say that out loud if you didn't want to, you know, just mm-hmm. because I just felt, like, responsible somehow for pulling that out of them. It can know? be intense being yeah. someone who's made a call like that. 
mm -hmm. then you get everything back. Yeah, yeah. And some of the stories were just like, some people were just like, you know, I took this picture in a state park and I was going to like jump off a bridge afterward. And it's just like, wow. You yeah. Know? Wow. What inspired that was um, I had gone on disability from BuzzFeed because I was not well towards the end of my tenure there. And um, my insurance decided to stop um insuring me i don't know what the word is but cover they canceled my coverage or fuckers. like whatever yes yes they were being themselves Just fuckers yeah and um they decided that i was cured because they saw some pictures of me on social media there were two in particular oh. one i was at a wedding Whoa. another i was on the beach someplace in like mexico at some resort on vacation i was like okay I hear you. My therapist told me to do both of those things. They looked at your photos? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awful. And apparently it's a very, very common thing. And it's just like nobody knows. And like I remember the conversation that I had with this lady who, oh, if I remember her name and if I ever see her face and find her in the streets, ooh, a tongue lashing at least. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if I can fight. I've never been in a fight. <laughs> But um, just like her her tone, I was just like, well, what are you, I don't understand what are you talking about? Like this this is part of my healing, you know? Like you don't know this because you don't know me as a person, but like I use social media to work through stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and she was like, um, well, you know, we've been, they also looked at my Twitter timeline and like you've been talking about starting a, a newsletter, which I've been talking about starting a newsletter for years. Also, you know what I like, mean? It's, it's 2019. Everyone's talking about starting a newsletter. Exactly. It's the only thing we do. What else? What else is this there? This is you so know? fucked. And I think it's like, so this tweet that you sent here, I mean, part of what you're getting at is how it's so not possible to judge mm -hmm. the state of someone's mind mm -hmm. based on a photograph. Based which on a photograph. Which seems obvious, but what you're, what you're talking about is like, no, in fact... People are making those decisions based yeah. on something as shallow as a photograph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, I just remember the tone. She was like, you did this. Da, da, da. We looked at your social media as if she had like a trump card or something. And I was like, do you have it open right now? Because let me walk you through these pictures. This picture where I was on the beach, I had just had a fight with my mother that morning because it was my birthday. And she had said something that didn't sit well with me. I set a boundary. She got upset. I cried. Like, does it matter that I'm on the beach crying or does it matter that I'm on the beach? Because I, if you can put on pants and go to a beach, you can put on pants and go to work and be miserable. I yeah. guess is the sentiment behind it. Yeah. But it just, it, it really upset me because it also suggests absolutely no knowledge of how social media works. Yeah. Like, yeah. People are miserable all the time yeah. and they curate their timeline so that they don't look miserable all the time. Well, or how, you know, something like anxiety works. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, it, like this this story about being in this, you know, best costume of your life, which I think it, it like, I know it's a great feeling when you're like, I mean, when we were at BuzzFeed one year, I was log lady from Twin Peaks. And I think for me, <laughs> it was one of my, like, I felt so proud of that costume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, it's like that feeling of like, this is like my best costume I've ever put together. Yeah. Also, and, I was able to do a thing, yeah, which isn't always easy to do. But you're still there. You've got, you know, you've had an anxiety attack or two. You're like feeling that still in your breathing. It's like that that person who's judging you over the phone. I mean, their job is to fuck you over, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the problem is we yeah. shouldn't have insurance involved. With, like everyone should have access to therapy, et cetera. Yeah. There shouldn't be some point blank for-profit companies standing in the middle of that but yeah. I mean that that's the system we have and it's just like that person's job is to misunderstand the nature of mm -hmm. how something like a propensity to have panic attacks works absolutely or a propensity to have spells where you're so low you can't get up mm -hmm. you know like or it's like w when you've got a challenge that is like getting worse getting worse getting worse is too much to deal with it's like mm -hmm. that thing that happens it's like sometimes it's every single day it's a brand new yeah. it's like the the idea that we have a system that's rooted around oh do you have it or not which is very silly it's like yeah. we're all gonna have the challenges that we have going forward like mm -hmm. maybe you're gonna figure out a way to like deal yeah. maybe there's gonna be some real strong thing that you do for yourself you like yeah you find some some answer for yourself that mm -hmm. really helps you continue to get through but like ugh, it's such a frustrating story and it's yeah. also just like it's the reality that w that's that that those are the people who are making these decisions like that's right yeah, like that's Susanna from Arkansas or ever who has like not 
taken my medical history, no, you know, hasn't. No. Also, I just, I just, I just think there's so much shady stuff going on because they would just insist that my doctor wasn't sending over this, sending over that, and I'm just like, she is. Like, I'm copied on the emails. Like, what are you, what are you doing? What are you talking about? And it's, it's just like, stuff like this stands in the way of mental health. So yeah, you know, it's like this really kind of thing. Does. It's so frustrating, and mm-hmm. it's like, yeah. I mean, the system makes no sense. And then th- I think what that does in turn to someone who's already needing help. Mm-hmm. Is it, it just compounds the problem. It's so discouraging. It, I mean, I think one of the things that you've spent a lot of time talking about and I think really like modeled, you know, is just like how much it is like kind of a constant battle, like the sense of kind of having to con- constantly renegotiate. Well, how am I going to, you know, like mm. not just like how am I going to be in general, but just like how am I going to get to the next thing? Yeah. You know, that sense of like going back to the party. I mean, I don't know. I've I've had um, I've had panic attacks uh I mean, I think more through my adult life. I think I know what they are now, you mm-hmm. know, like I don't know when I would have learned that that's yeah. knowing that I think helps because especially when it's an occasion where it's really severe and it sort of overtakes, you know, just like, oh, got to cancel all the plans way. Like, yeah. oh, there's yeah. nothing else is going to happen yeah. for hours now. You yeah, know, it's, it's lost. this it's is lost what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sense of like, What's happening externally? Because I was when I was reading this, um, you know, the the thread that you'd had with the sexy Steve Harvey photo. I was thinking about one of the worst panic attacks I've ever had, mm. and it was definitely one of those ones where if you had seen a photo of me that day, when the next day you'd say, "Oh, this person's fine. They're exactly. happy. Yeah, you know, oh, they're on their book tour. They're so happy. They're this, upright. This they're must outside. be the best. Mm-hmm. You know." And I, I, I mean, that was like one of the scariest nights of my mm. life. If you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I think that that contrast between what people are actually going through or what's happening behind closed doors or what's happening in a bathroom stall or whatever yeah. versus what we're putting out there. And like that is something that I think, you know, this effort to sort of be candid about mental health on social media does combat that. Yeah. I mean, it is one yeah. of the ways. Like For if that sure. person had read their t- your timeline, hopefully they also saw plenty of tweets about yeah. mental health. Yeah, because like, it's it's very much something that I think you're 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 putting out there and you're encouraging others to kind of follow in your footsteps. Yeah. I do try. I do consciously try to do that now. Like now that I'm in a, a place where, you know, I can say, you know, I don't need to share this particular thing maybe to feel better, but it could be helpful for some other people. Like that's a call that I've got, like the energy and the clarity to make more intentionally, more often. But um, I mean, nobody is going to post a video or a boomerang of them crying in the closet. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so then no, if you do, then people are going to yeah. act like oh you're, my gosh, you're crazy you're, or you're, no, 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 no. you, you want attention or, exactly. you know, um, yeah. and I think I sometimes run into that sort of, that conundrum of wanting too. to be like, oh, um, this is what's actually going on. Mm-hmm. And then uh, what appears to be going on and wanting to kind of like, uh, short, like you know, make that chasm less less profound. But sometimes it's not possible to like let people know what's going on. Sometimes yeah. it's like to do so would be even more injurious to yourself. Yeah, seriously. Because also, like, once you put that part of yourself out there, like once the story is out, you can't police it. Mm-hmm. You know, like you can't. And depending on like how many people it reaches, you can't like email everybody and be like, "Hey, this thing that you were like were thinking or like whatever, you know, this is incorrect. Let me tell you my whole like story." So it's at once like empowering, but then scary yeah because once it's out there it's just like out there and I worry all the time I'm just like I'm probably so annoying people are tired of hearing me talk about anxiety and this that and the third and sometimes that does like get to me and I'm just like I don't I don't go well let me post happy things I just like don't post Mm -hmm. you know what I mean so it's it's a lot it's like a snow globe of frustration (laughs) I mean for what it's worth I think you're one of the people who I feel a lot of uh you know I think just when I read sometimes what you're posting about anxiety, for example, I just am like, oh, okay, you know, like I am not the only one. Mm. And I think it can be very easy to fall into the like, I am the only one, I hell, still do hell that. pit. I do too. Yeah. I mean, I really do too. I'll be like, I'm the only one who's mm-hmm. caught in this terrible place. You know, like yeah. my my head is this just sinkhole of, you know, of, of self just berating and you know all and just the the amount that 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 can completely overtake you and Mm -hmm. in my line of work like writing about mental health which 
I don't even know how I ended up doing this on some level because I mm. definitely didn't go into it writing about myself or wanting to sort of share of myself. It's very much like something that sort of has followed. And it's interesting, like right now, and even saying that I have, um, you know, I've been diagnosed before with a generalized anxiety disorder, which mm. means what it does. But it's like, I've never said that to anybody. Like, I don't mm. write about that. Yeah. Um, I think I kind of hold that a little closer because 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 I don't know yeah like, I, I have because you don't know who will hurt you once they're welcomed into that like there's space. that yeah. there's that and just not really knowing where to fit it in mm-hmm. um and also I think a lot of people perhaps with my work have presumed that I don't have personal experiences because I wrote a book about a relative mm-hmm. like I wrote a book about a relative so they assume oh well you're you're fine and then yeah. you know, and I'm yeah. like oh uh, uh, here's my whole life story <laughs> right and here's all my trauma and can it's we like, put fine in like yeah funnier? like like do you want to hear all about it like it's and it's mm-hmm. like you don't want to necessarily like I mean that I think that conundrum of you don't want to treat everybody to the worst shit that ever happened to you yeah that is real uh, that is real moments, because it, yeah it also like it involves you reliving the worst things that have ever happened to you on some former level. And Absolutely. like, it doesn't, at least I haven't hit a point now where like, I don't, I think for me, a lot of people feel like, you know, like, I don't know, not that I'm like fine every day, but you know, that like, I, I got it. Like I got a handle on it. You know, like when things happen, I can just like pull out my toe toping cools <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> pull out your toping cools <laughs> you got it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's the title of my self help book that Tope I now have cool. to write. Tough and cool. Oh my gosh, Chase Clay. <laughs> oh shit. Um, but Damn. yeah, I think they assume that. Like, I you know, really hope you just get sent like a contract I from ha- like whoever did like Amy Sedaris's at home book just sends you a contract right I now. I hope so. I'm certain they're listening. Uh, this is great. I have a new career focus. That's fantastic. Tough and cool. <laughs> So, yeah, they think I can just pull out all of my toping cools. Yeah. And, you know, like, even if I have, like, a tough time, I'm generally fine. I'm generally okay, which is not always the truth. Like, I go through days that are bad enough that, like, I feel like I still feel shame. I still feel like when you were talking about how you kept and keep your diagnosis close to your chest, I did the same thing with my depression. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I was diagnosed as depressed a full year before I even tweeted it on Twitter. And as somebody who tweets everything on Twitter, yeah. I was terrified to do that because mm. it just felt like like anxiety was like cool. Everybody had anxiety, <laughs> you know, but like yeah. I don't know, the depression just felt like a failure to me and it felt even more like a failure because I knew that I was buying into like the stigma and the shame, but like even as good as you get with this stuff, you're still human and it's still hard and like you're not you're not Teflon, you know? I get ashamed of... <laughs> I kind of, like, exist in shame. Yeah. Usually for one reason or another, yeah, you know? same. Like, I look goofy running for this bus. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm so I'm ashamed. Of, like, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Me running for the bus. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in the world saw it, even though there was nobody on the street. Everybody saw it. So... It's, it's a lot of the examples I feel like you give and, like, this is really real. It's, like, there, there's small things. It's seemingly, it can be in context. It's a small thing. But it's, like, last night I was, like, trying to pull up some theater tickets and the thing wouldn't load. And I was, like, what if I didn't buy them? What if I didn't buy them? Yeah. What if I thought we were here? And I uh-huh. totally met... And it wouldn't load and it wouldn't load and it's it like, wouldn't oh load. God, and I, I got to go God, outside. I'd, like, mm-hmm. tell people, like, hi, I had to go back outside. <laughs> and it turned out I just already had the tickets. Like, they yeah. weren't pickup. Uh-huh. And I was, like, wow. Yeah. But I really... So I many felt times a week kind of that. like a, a, a pressure rising that was so swift. Mm-hmm. And, and like before I'd noticed, I was totally freaking out. And, yeah. and, you know. And I think that's it's irritability. Like when you're nervous about something, when you are in a heightened emotional state, which is a helpful phrase that um, I heard my therapist say once. And I was like, well, this makes perfect sense. Yeah. If you're generally anxious all the time anyway, then you already start on kind of like a five. Yeah. And then like if you had like a day or a time or like as that frustration builds and builds and builds, you get more irritable because you don't have the energy and like the proper blood flow to your brain to be logical about stuff. And then it gets to the point where it's just like, okay, if one more thing happens, I'm done. And that thing is usually like my internet went out while I was watching the Basketball Wives reunion and now I'm crying in my living room. <laughs> like, why does this always happen to me? I'm just trying to be happy. Yeah. Ugh, it sucks. It it can suck. It really it really can suck. I think I've I've um 
I've spent too much time thinking about all this and I don't end up with much like mm. at the end, you know, like I think having hung out way too much in this headspace of sort of like, what's this all about or what mm-hmm. should we do about all this or what are big takeaways? And I feel like I don't actually come out with very much. But one thing that I do often come back to is that what you're talking about, feeling, for example, a sort of self-recrimination or kind of like self-imposed shame around even wanting to say, oh, I've got a depression diagnosis Mm -hmm. or, oh, I'm feeling really low or I'm really depressed, Mm -hmm. like whatever way someone wants to say it, like that, you know, that kind of stigma, that is something that we are getting from a culture that I think so easily vilifies psych patients, Absolutely. crazy people. Absolutely. Like I think that that is there, that, mm-hmm. that sort of um, the, the ease with which people this time of year mm-hmm. will just vilify mental health stuff and yeah. it becomes horror. And yeah. I don't know, I, I was curious, like when I was talking about at the top, like Were there any stories that leapt to mind for you of like instances where you've sort of like seen psychiatry stuff used in a Halloween way? It's okay if you don't actually have an example, but I was Mm -hmm. wondering if you did have an example of kind of putting those those things together in like horror movies or anything like that. Um, I don't know that I do like looking back, like I just remember like a whole lot of like psycho killer costumes yes. you know like or just like a psycho version of anything oh like what are, what are you oh i'm a psycho fisherman okay wow. yeah <laughs> you know yeah. Like, what is what psycho is psycho jogging dog <laughs> <laughs> why <laughs> what happened you know like how dogs how need to get exercise they... light exercise not light like exercise. a full run <laughs> <laughs> um but i think it's only recently that i've been thinking and i think it's because of um my addiction to true crime mm-hmm um, I have noticed fairly quickly, I think, that um, men are the worst true crime hosts, mm. um, white ones in particular, um, because it's always for them. Like you can tell who you can usually suss out who has no experience with not only like the stigma of mental health and stuff, but just like with the stigma of anything. Mm. You know what I mean? Like especially. Like when they're trying to be like funny, like you have to be careful when you joke about murder and mental health and rape and, you know, make sure that you're punching in the right direction and they never, ever are. There's this one um, podcast in particular that got actually a lot of backlash recently. Um, I don't know if you want to name it. I'll name it. It's Sword and Scale. The host is a piece of shit. We had it out on the timeline. I've never heard of it. it out in real life if you want. I've never heard of it, but we do officially have beef with them. And yes! I'm very excited. Yeah, it's yes! good. We've needed some good podcast beef. So, oh my uh, gosh. Yeah, well, great. let me tell what you what they this do. Story. So, what, what happened was um, this is like when I'm first really getting into like true crime podcasts, right? And this particular show was very dramatic, right? And it was dramatic in a way that I didn't really notice the things that kind of like poked my eyeball a little bit. Like, well, you know, you should qualify this statement a little more and you should maybe not act like, um, all murderers have a mental problem or that all people with mental problems hurt other people. Yes. Yes. He, it's such a lazy stereotype. It's so lazy. It, it, it's not founded in fact. And it, it just makes everything worse for yeah. everybody who needs help. For everybody who needs help. And it also does nothing to help erase the stigma, you know, like in all of this guy's stories were like, um, you know, when you're when you're on the bus, you never know if the person sitting next to you is like hearing voices and could pull out a machete and blah, 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 blah. And in the beginning, people were like, hey, like your show. But just want to let you know that, you know, people with mood disorders and mental health issues are more likely to be the victims of violence and the perpetrators of yeah. violence. And maybe have a show where the perpetrators are not like schizophrenic which was like his thing you know oh, like it was just like charming his. yeah we yeah. do have beef mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so he asked the question once on um on his general timeline and at this point like you know i hadn't really interrogated it a lot because i'm just like you know you put up this, it's a problematic like show but it didn't really like hit me how problematic it mm-hmm. was until i started interacting with the host who called himself the tom brady of podcasting. Ew. Yeah, kind of says it all. Ew. So he asked this question. He was just like, do you all really want more diversity in, um, like, racial diversity in true crime stories, right? Uh, I answer in earnest yeah. because I'm assuming that he really wants an answer to this question. Ew. Oh, God. And um, I respond. I take a lot of time. I'm very, you know, I explain a lot of stuff. And I'm just like, 
uh, well, yeah, I know it sounds crazy to say, you know, we need more like black stories or brown stories represented in true crime. But we do, and here's why. Because it, it sets up this dichotomy where the only stories that we care about are the ones where there's a pretty little girl white victim. Yeah. And when all of the perpetrators and the, the criminals are big, bad black people, you know, it, it helps to uphold a lot of really awful things that people already think about black people. And, you know, it it matters. Like, people like true crime because um, they... <clears throat> true crime allows you to feel sympathy for the victims and survivors. Yeah. And, you know, you could do something really powerful and tell the stories of people of color who have had, like, really awful things happen to them and present them as normal people. Because then, like, when you're listening to a podcast, like, you don't even have to, like, mention a race or whatever, but just, like, set up a situation where someone can feel sympathy for someone who is not white. Yeah. That could be so powerful. Ugh. And so I explained that, and his response was, uh. so you really want more stories about... Uh, black murderers and blah 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 blah. Yes. And I was like, number one, you didn't read anything I said. Yeah. Number two, how dare you? Because He's not like having a real engagement with this, he uh, he did not want a real answer. He wanted head. somebody to agree with what he'd already decided in his head. Because yeah. apparently, people were like, you know, you should like fix this or diversify it a little yeah. bit. I wasn't one of the ones who was doing it. But then, so we have this conversation on the timeline, and he he slides into my DMs. <gasps> he gets so self righteous. And he was like, uh, he said, oh, but he was like, can you please call your dogs off, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, first of all, <laughs> you ought to go apologize to them for calling them dogs. That is fucked up. Exactly. And then I was like, um, I haven't sicked anybody on you. They saw your words and they're yeah, responding to they're them. They're responding to your tweet, you racist exactly. fuck. Right. And then I was just like, I'd, I'd had enough because like I I had brought a lot of listeners to his show mm. because I was doing like a... I talked about true crime yeah, all the time. You like it's true like, crime. I don't understand. It. I have to be honest, but honestly, you like it. I love it. Yeah, possibly it's a little good. too much. You got something that you love. Like, go for it. It keeps me. It makes me feel safe. Oddly, yeah. I just listen to like really like nerdy kind of like podcasts. They're like science about like the history of the brain or something. Like that's all. Yeah. I do. it's just so boring. I I don't listen to anything fun or. <laughs> That's fair. I'll be like, oh, I have to go on a trip. I'll just bring like three 500 page books. And I'm like, <laughs> just the weirdest choices. Anyway, I, this, I so this it. man, this it. man is in your DMs. He's in my DMs and he's he's so righteously indignant because I have sent my dogs after him and blah, blah, blah. Oh. And I'm just like, I didn't send anything to anybody. But I was like, while you're here, uh. how dare you speak to me this way? I gave you an honest answer to a question that I thought you were asking in earnest. Right. And I was like, it's fucked up. Racially, this is fucked up, blah, 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 blah. And then he said, all I remember is, he. it was like this paragraph of something, and he was like, you use race as a trump card, and you beat people over the head with it, mm. and you push people away, mm. blah, 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 blah. You know who does that? White people. Hello! Yeah, like that's Hello. the whole system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we got really in his feelings. We wow. went back and forth. Then, once he realized he fucked up, he was like, okay, well, can we just hug it out? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no. No, you were rude no. to me. And you owe me an apology. You called the people dogs. Exactly. And you spoke horribly to me in my face. Well, in my electronic face. In my electronic living room. You can't do that. And so yeah. he apologized in the DMs. And I was like, mm-mm. You um, uh, disrespected me in public. You will apologize in public or you won't do it at all. Half-assed it. And I was like, all right. You're dead to me. And I was like, everybody, fuck this podcast. It's done. That's and now great. he's been dropped from so many networks. Oh. And yeah, he's a piece of shit. And now everybody knows it. See, yay! Happy endings do happen. You have power in this, <laughs> in this town. <laughs> that felt good. The digital town of podcasting, <laughs> podcast view. But I mean, I think that there's something that your your that story makes me think of that I often think about, which is like intersectionality is one of those buzzwords, or it's one of those terms that gets used too much. And I think often when I think of intersectionality, I think of the fact that prejudice is intersectional, mm. where you know people who are going to make schizophrenics into monstrous murder. Right. with a lot of ease are I'm not shocked if he's also a racist and he's also a misogynist or yeah. he's also a homophobe or he's also a transphobe it's like he's all of the things it's like often someone who's kind of carrying around because it's like well what do the, all these things have in common well mm -hmm. you've decided ahead of time what a person is or that a person isn't a person mm -hmm. they aren't a person like you mm -hmm. and it's like it's so boring yeah it, 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 yes, and, it's and, lazy yes and it often travels in packs like that you know to, yeah. to, to take his dog 
dog metaphor. <laughs> like I think the, you know, the the fact of like a certain kind of, a, I mean, this is an example of it, but like this White House loves, loves to shit on crazy people, oh right? Gosh. Like that's one of their fave things, but they've got lots of other fave things. Like they <laughs> like to shit on black and brown people yeah. and they like to shit on women. And it's like mm-hmm. LGBT. People. It's like, yes, you know, they think that it's, it, it's a, it's a good, it's a, it's at least a, it reminds me that yes, all of these things are related. As long mm-hmm. as we allow ourselves to believe in some sort of archetype of this, scary mentally ill person who's beyond you know they they're they're not worthy of sympathy or Mm -hmm. of empathy or of you know um kind of like you you're not going to tell their story leaning away from but into stereotype exactly and and i think like halloween costumes are are an example of that i think Mm -hmm. where we we do with halloween we, we take things, we reduce them to kind of their essence or we kind of figure out, you know, and, and I think that's why yeah. when I run into a straight jacket, like one time in Brooklyn, I think it was last fall, I was walking down, it was like in um, like Carroll Gardens, brownstones, like where people have pretty front you know stoops and they'll re- yeah. some of them really overdo it mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. and there was one of those where they'd really overdone it all this halloween shit moving spider yeah. webby ghosts <laughs> ooh, stuff right yeah. but the thing in the center was this like life-size figure oh, no. in a like in a chair with electrodes on his head. Oh my God. Who was like grimacing. Oh my God. And he was an animatronic horrible. and he was like wearing like sweatpants. And I, w- I stopped in the street and was like, oh my God. Like that. Uh. I mean, either, okay, it could have been an electric chair and it was executing an inmate. That's mm-hmm. one interpretation, but I'm pretty sure it was an electroshock machine yeah. and it was a psych patient. And Ugh. it was like, either way, that's fucked up. Either, but, but, like in general, why is this okay? Yeah. Why do you think this is okay? Like what on earth is going on? And I guess I've been thinking about Halloween the last few years. I think white people have started to notice mm. like it's bad to put on black or brown face, for example. Finally. A little bit. Finally. Some They're people, getting there. Some of them. The prime minister of Canada has learned. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like there does seem to be a little bit of at least a, a, a wider cultural recognition mm-hmm. that maybe certain things that were once perceived as being okay are no, are longer, no okay. longer okay. Yeah. And I think it's because change, unfortunately, can be painfully slow, especially mm-hmm. when like the the culture that we grew up in has normalized looking at all of these things in this way. Yeah. You know, like you've got, um, I also didn't watch horror movies because I was just like, scary and I want to do it but like um yeah I like watched one horror movie once and it still fucks me up what you was know? The horror oh, movie? I watched The Ring <gasps> oh my gosh The Ring is the movie where I was like all right I'm out I'm, I'm still if a out. telephone rings I'm Mm-mm. like we're all gonna die when I finished watching The Ring I was at my uncle's house with my college roommate in Lexington Kentucky and as soon as the movie went off do you know that the phone rang? This happened to me and my friends too. Oh my where gosh, the phone rang, we alive? Like a friend's mom called and we were uh, all like, ah! uh, uh, I was like, this. I really thought it was going to be my last night on the planet. <laughs> um, but um, I feel like there are so many stories. Also, there are so many horror movies that are like composites of actual real life, horrible, like murdery serial killers. Like um, uh, Hannibal, The it puts the lotion on its skin. Silence in of the part, Lambs. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. There you go. In part, based on, I think, Ed Gain, possibly mm. Gary Hodnick. Mm. Ed Gain, I think, was the one who, like, actually, like, was trying to make a suit out of a woman's skin. Yeah. And I mean, like, these are not common cases of no. people who are not okay in the head. You know what I mean? And not nobody knows that because of the movies and because of, like, even the phrases that we use. Like, oh, have you had your meds today? You're acting a little crazy. Um, I saw a clip from a reality show a couple days ago from, I think it's Black China's reality show. It made me so sad. I think it was her and her mom. Her mom seems to be a raging bitch. Um, and she's there having a fight. And her mom's just like, you need therapy. You need a therapist. And like the way that she's like, she spat it at her. And I'm just like, this is not an insult. Yeah. Everybody needs therapy. Yeah. Also, you are calling your daughter a bitch and she's the one who needs therapy. Like, you know what I mean? Just the the way that we use the lingo and 
interact with things that we don't know anything about yeah. how many people have gone to therapy not enough what would have happened if jason had gotten therapy could have been all right you know <laughs> he could have started like how a- many horror films could be averted <laughs> if we just had universal <laughs> therapy i think we found the message and we know how to save <laughs> much of the world <sighs> but it's so normalized like, yes and it's even hard for me like i'm trying really hard not to use the word crazy insane etc it's hard. Yeah. It's so hard. And I know it's going to take a long time yeah. for like me any to snap out of that. Linguistic change. It's mm-hmm. a matter of habit. Yeah. And it's, it's like you ingrained know? in your bones, you know, and it's it takes a long time to recognize that like, hey, this thing that I thought was OK my entire life is now not OK. Yes. And now I have to, first of all, figure out my uncomfortable feelings about me having done this not OK thing for yeah. so long and having trouble doing it. And now it's going to take a long time to, like, fix it and correct it. And I think it's this roundaboutly the same with blackface. Yes. That should have been not OK a long Absolutely. time ago. You know what I mean? And it's just like a, sh- a slow crawling burn across the Sahara on your knees and it's just going to take forever. But that little, you know, that little action of, I think, you know, one of the reasons it's kind of fun to try to remove insane and crazy from one's vernacular, for example, is it does really shine a light on how much speech is automatic or, Mm -hmm. you know, how much actually you're not really thinking about your choices. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it, it, it took me a few years to kind of phase those words out. I still mess up. Mm-hmm. I'll have a moment where I will say, and like my husband will like look at me like, mm-hmm. what'd you do? You know, <laughs> <laughs> which is fair. I'll yeah. be like, oh, whoops. You my know, man. but like I will also, I mean, I mess up my own pronouns in mm. my head once in a while or in wow. my dreams once in a while. You know what I mean? Like that it, has to be confusing. It's very hard to mm. change a habit, especially a linguistic habit. But it's because like it's so, such an old habit. Yes. The words that we use. They're there. And I think that that's sort of the way that a, a sort of like a white person who's very upset that they can't like reprise their racist costume anymore or whatever, mm-hmm. like that that person or that person who's now embarrassed about a choice that they made in the past yeah. or whatever. It's like, well, kind of like the person who is, uh, you know, has their fe- feathers ruffled by the by the idea of a trans person asking for new pronouns or mm-hmm. it's like any change like that, you know, it really is a matter of, have you know, putting in a little bit of effort, yes. like being slightly willing to grow mm-hmm. and how it does seem like they're There is, I think, if you're in therapy, for example, I do think you're going to be maybe more open to the idea that, like, yeah, change takes work. Mm -hmm. Things are, you know, and then there's maybe people who've never been to therapy (laughs) who are like, oh, I uh, can't change. Change is impossible. I don't want to. Or just that sort of childishness. And so then y'all need to stop being so sensitive. Yeah. (laughs) I know. Yeah. You see, that's the thing about it. And it's just. Yeah. It's so frustrating. That idea of being called sensitive for showing reaction to, you know, I, I really identify with that. And I think it's one of those, and it's obviously, I think there's a lot of gender shit there too. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it being like a little girl and you're crying, then you're a girl who's crying, you mm-hmm. know, and like, right, and right. you are being, you know, emotional or whatever it is. And like, you know, that kind of stuff is just so pervasive. And I think it is part of where, you know, some like, if if we could have a change around that, even just the, the yeah. uh, not just around, oh, whether or not people can be candid about their diagnoses or their struggles, but just about their emotional life, you know? Right. There's so much we are, we are trained to just shut down or mm-hmm. shut out or pretend like mm-hmm. things aren't happening the way they are. Yeah. Having to, like, being told and taught to not feel your emotions is horrible because you're supposed, feelings are called feelings because you're supposed to feel them because that's your body yeah. saying something's off, yeah. something's not right, yeah. you yeah. know, and it's a thing that, it's a thing that encourages empathy. Yeah. And so when you're telling somebody who is telling you like, hey, this hurt me and, yeah. you know, this is my boundary. Yeah. And because you feel so bad about having crossed the boundary with somebody that you care about or you don't want to be looked at as this awful person. So you get defensive and then you double down because you can't be like, you know what, you're right. I was also taught not to feel my feelings or whatever, which I think, again, comes back to, like, the stigma and destigmatizing everything, which is why I'm so glad that, like, this show exists and that there are people on Twitter who just in being like, hey, I don't feel great today. Mm. Like, even that is enough to, like, start chipping in that at that big-ass mountain of a mountain. Mm-hmm. But um, it it gets discouraging to me to think about how much work has to be done before we can get to... A point where people are like, you know, maybe I've been wrong. Yeah, it's you know? so hard to get. It's so hard. I, I, and it does seem, you know, I think the like the example of Halloween costumes is a good it it brings out some of the like kind of 
uh, most intractable side of people, you mm-hmm. know, sort of like people not wanting to change that sense of, or it, it's like, I often think about, you know, people who are kind of uh, really devoted to this president, for example. And mm. I'm like, is it just because if they were to look in the mirror for a second, they would see how horrific it is? So you're just committing to the mm-hmm. bit like an abuser commits to, you know, mm-hmm. and I really think it is. It, it's and it, it's like the rest of us are kind of standing here being like, we see you, though, yeah. you know, like and, and I think with stuff like someone really leaning on, you know, that trope of the mur- murderous psychopath or something. It's like I feel the same way. I'm like, mm-hmm. if you were to let yourself look at the truth of what you're doing right now even a little bit which is you're taking a group of people who are very socially vulnerable Mm -hmm. and people diagnosed with schizophrenia I mean that's one of the most socially vulnerable people groups of people in this society and you're turning them into villains against kind of logic and data like there's not actually as much there as one one would suppose based on the pop culture and you're doing it to what feel better about yourself to feel like you're sane and you're normal and you're not going to murder anybody or Mm -hmm. it's like I don't know, like that yeah. that sort of thing, like someone who judges someone for being forthcoming about their own mental health, for example, it's like, that's one of those spaces where I have very little patience for people. Yeah, yeah. And I also think that it's because people don't want to feel like they're bad people. Mm. And for yes. someone to tell you like, hey, this word that you've been using is not great. It's not right. The way that you portray these kind of people is not right. This podcast and the way that you do it is not right. I yeah. think people get so instantly defensive because nobody wants to be seen as a racist. Nobody wants to be seen as transphobic. Well, there are things that you can do to reverse that. Also, you like we are. We're all affected by this, mm. you know, like the quote unquote well ones, the quote unquote unwell ones, like, yes. you know, like the way that you were taught to thought is wrong and you are, it's poisoning you as it's poisoning me in a different way. But, you know, like being called out on your shit is not being somebody being like, well, you're a terrible person and your entire family fucked up and you were raised wrong and you're just like, you shouldn't be on the earth anymore. And yeah. I think that's how people take it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if people just knew that like, it's all right to be wrong, it's okay to repeat toxic things that you were not taught were toxic yes but once you know they're toxic then you have to do something about it yes and it seems like your story i think has a good example of something that comes up a lot in our society right now which is just like um people need to be taught how to apologize oh my gosh oh my gosh how to apologize like what that actually is and like and i think it's like any of us who have ever received an apology know the difference between a real one and a fake one and Mm -hmm. it's like it's just one of those basic things it seems like a lot of this really does come from kind of stepping i mean it seems like part of the problem for in my estimation is that myth of the sane person Mm -hmm. because I just I don't think such thing exists Um, which isn't to say that every person should have a diagnosis it's like no but I do think there's this sort of this sense that we have that some people are better than others yeah more stable or because they don't you know exactly there's no such thing because you don't know what's coming tomorrow bro Mm. like something really unforeseen could happen to you Mm -hmm. at any age it doesn't matter what's happened to you so far it doesn't matter what you think your family history is or your genes are it's like no, this the the nature of madness, so to speak, is that it's human. Like, yeah. and some people are much more in the thick of it, and some mm-hmm. people have no option but to see that reality. And I think that you know, letting go of that sense of some monstrous other, you yeah. know, I think that that's become one of my obsessions. Yeah, a thing that I have been trying to do more often is remind myself that other people go through this stuff too, mm. because like. A lot of times my therapist has to be like, you know, I'm just like, oh, I had a tough day. You know, I woke up and I wasn't feeling great. And so then I couldn't get this thing done. Da, da, da. And a lot of times it feels like a failure and I feel like I have to start over. And she'll just very gently be like, well, you know, everyone has bad days. And I'm just like, bitch, you right. Like, why do I forget that? You know, like you don't have to have anxiety disorder to know what anxiety feels like. Yes. You don't have to have depression to be depressed sometimes you know but I mean we're made to feel that way because of the black and white and the dichotomy around it and it's so frustrating yeah the um Halloween overall yay or nay (laughs) do we have a verdict we've gotten into it a little bit for me in general yay Mm -hmm. however I do know someone who refers to and has for a while referred to Halloween as blackface Christmas Mm-hmm. Because it's when all the whites are like, yep, 
it's time. It's the most wonderful time of the year. So there's also yeah. like, I like participating in it, but I don't like having to gird myself for all the horrible stuff I'm going to see. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the problem of this holiday. Mm -hmm. It's And, and I, I, I love this holiday in some respect. And I think as a little kid, I looked forward to it because I liked dressing up. I mm -hmm. liked sort of getting to be something else. Yeah. Was appealing to me for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but the permission that it gives so many people. I mean, I uh. when I lived in my 20s in Iowa City, Iowa. It's like a big college, you know, big 10 college town where there's just like thousands and thousands of blackout undergrads. Mm. The kind of shit you'd see on Halloween was so appalling yeah. and just like the amount of like just really clear like terrible behavior that mm -hmm. was kind of being generally encouraged and I don't know it definitely made me like less of a fan of the holiday overall. For sure, for sure. And also like um, we had similar things on uh, my campus. I went to the whitest school in the world. Yeah. Um, and like it didn't even have to be Halloween for them to put on offensive shit. Like they had something called Old South Week where they dressed up like Confederate soldiers mm. and da 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 da. And like even in the correction <laughs> of that, you know, <laughs> it's such a normal thing to me. I'm just saying. But like even when the when the campus corrected it, they didn't educate the people on why they could not do it. Mm. You know, it's just like, you know, it's a sensitive thing. We can't do it on campus anymore. Do it on another, like, whatever. And so they don't know why it was wrong. They don't know that, like, a black person seeing somebody dressed as a Confederate soldier, even though I was not alive back then, sure, I'm still kind of triggered. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I watch documentaries, shit. you know? Like, yeah. And so there's there's not, there's no commitment, especially on college campuses, I think, to really teaching why this stuff is wrong. Like, yeah, ban it. Have them not do it in view of other people, but tell them why. Otherwise, we're just too sensitive and the yeah. PC police are out Yeah, again. they think they've lost something. Like yeah, someone who the thinks victims. like, oh, like I can't say insane and crazy now like mm -hmm. that. And they think that's a loss to them. And it's like, as long as you are, I think it's like, as long as you are without history, yeah. right? Like if you're a white person and you're putting on like some regalia of that era and you're doing so thinking it's fine, the only mm -hmm. explanation is you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You no have idea. no sense of the history. You've 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 been taught some version of it that totally elides the truth mm -hmm. and it's like and I think with the with the sort of like the stereotyping of psych patient related stuff in Halloween, it seems like it's a similar thing where there's just a real absence of yeah. information around what the reality is of this history, uh, you know, of what the experience has been for people who've been institutionalized right. in this country now and in the past, like what the what the reality of something like a straitjacket is. Yeah. Like the moment you really start to think about what a straitjacket is and when that's getting used and the moment, I mean, maybe Maybe you're someone who has been, you know, confined, yeah. you know, maybe you have been on the receiving end of forced psychiatry. Like the stuff is not funny at all. It's mm -hmm. not fun at all. It's the very opposite of that. It is triggering. Mm -hmm. And it's like it does seem like this holiday gives a level of permission that can be very high to just people kind of breaking yeah. out symbols that they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's Halloween, man. It's just a joke. Yeah. Because now everybody can be like, it's just a joke and not just comics who are not aging well. You Oof. know, like everybody gets to do that. Oh, man. I can't believe that some comics still get to say things it's I, tough <laughs> i rewatched dave Chappelle's last special this six, sticks and stones one yes and i did it because i wanted to see how my friend who had not seen it yet how what the critiques would be and within five minutes like it's kind of victim -y, it's very transphobic it's da -da 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 -da. i heard that yeah it's, <laughs> it's really bad it's really <laughs> awful and like the amount of whining that this rich ass man does because there's possibly one thing on the earth that he should not joke about because it has actual physical consequences for people who live on this earth. I'm just like, how do you not get the disconnect between you telling awful trans jokes and trans women being murdered? Yeah. And for somebody to be so, you know, of the community, these these are your sisters. These are black trans women who are being murdered in mass. And for you to just double down to the point of not even trying to hear the other side, he's smart. He's too smart. This is just him being crotchety and afraid of having to change. Gender, I mean, it, it, I think it's, it is one of those. And, and being someone who, you know, I get called gentleman and ma'am about equally if I'm in the public sphere. I mean, mm. I think uh, gender is one of those points where I think there can be inside of people that intense intractability and intense yeah. desire to not acknowledge where you are within the greater kind of system and that that sense of like just doubling down on your prejudice because you don't want to look at the light at all. Yeah. I mean, I 
think, I'm probably not the only person who thinks this, but like Dave Chabal has some gender shit going on. He's very yeah. obsessed with trans people. Yeah. Like, I mean, I he think sure I felt does. the same way about Louis C.K. Like there's yeah. a lot of comedians who I, or it's just simply that this is what they have perceived as being a, a punching bag, you know, yeah. like, and maybe crazy people, that sort of like a category like that is another punching bag. So, mm-hmm. you know, maybe in like what's happening is like trans people, maybe we're less of a safe, you know, kind of object of a joke now. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it's less funny now to just make fun of someone for, but I don't know. I mean, like I walk in on a group of neighbors of mine I think it was like last uh it was was maybe going over for Hanukkah or something and I walked in on a group of people and the the laughter Mm. around some story where and and he's now she oh my god and you know I just like walked in on that scene and was like wow also how lazy and it was like you think this is funny it's the lowest hanging fruit Our last segment on Mad Chat is called What's Helping Today? And what we're Mm. each going to share is just a little something or a big something. But Mm -hmm. whatever it is that's that's helping you today, just just make today uh, possible (laughs) or recently something that's been something that's been helpful to you recently. Do you want to go first? What's Um, helping today? uh, Yeah, I'm going to have to talk myself through it because I'm having a I'm having a week. Yeah. I have been without my anxiety medicine for yeah. way too long and I mean I don't I think it's because I'm like able to go outside and be in the world again. Like I had missed a psych appointment and usually I'm at home so I'm like, "Hey doc, you want to get started a little bit early this week? Like what's going on?" But like I've been like back in the studio and interviewing again so I've fallen off and fallen behind. And my oh my gosh, the things that have just broken me down this we I could I had the worst night sleep last night and as soon as I had fallen asleep my radiator started doing the New York thing no, the like tick, 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 yes, tick, yes, tick, yes, like yes, something something's yes. in your building I got up and I, I started pacing that. and I just I was just like I can't believe this is happening I can't believe this is happening um so tough week there yeah um I think what is helping me is my clothes I like it like that's a thing <laughs> That I, number one, I'm not used to doing, like, having to get up and put on clothes to go outside because, like, between not working and the agoraphobia, I'm just, I've am just i just been in my PJs chilling for, like, months on end. Yeah, me too. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember having sand on another round and someone else, I can't remember who, but um, I think Audie Cornish also said this. But um, heaven's just like, you know, when when you see me looking great, I'm probably having a tough day because yeah. you need some kind of armor. You need some kind of something. And that had I had experience with that here and there. But like lately in this week in particular, it just gives me something else to focus on. Um, uh, also, I happen to have washed my hair before the spiral happened. So I was like, I'm like, all right, I got a place to start. You know, like what can I do to make my hair look even better with the rest of me? Um, so last night, like I laid out an outfit, which I never do. And it's just because I was up pacing and yeah. I needed something to do. I needed something to do. And I spent time looking for a lipstick that I thought was going to look nice with my shirt. And, you know, it made getting out of the house so much easier because I didn't have to have a panic attack about it before. Yeah. So firefighter method where they like have their boots with their, you know, they like a firefighter will have their boots with their pants, like with <gasps> so set they just so step- they can just leap in, oh, which I've always so thought smart. is very smart. That's so smart. But I'm I mean, that idea of kind of being prepared. Yeah. It, it is a really good trick mm-hmm. when you know that you might, like, as I often will get in my own way. And yes. there are certain things you can do several hours in, in advance better than right up at that moment where you have Absolutely. to actually get out of the house. Yeah. And it also, like, helps to motivate me to go outside and get out of the house. Because there, like, there have been days where I'm just like, okay, if I just sit here, I'm just going to, like, be in my head and it'll be a spiral what can I do while I'm here? Oh, also, I'm learning to do my own gel nail manicure. Yeah, you're, I mean, your outfit looks fabulous, but your nails I've been really noticing. Thank you they so look much. really good. Thanks. Um, I randomly bought like a $50 kit off of Amazon, which is another thing that usually helps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not my pockets, but I'm just like, I'm just going to buy stuff and then forget what I bought. So when it comes, it's great. Um, but um, that's like... That's like I think the closest as adults that we come to pure joy is when it we is. buy things that we don't understand, like we don't remember on the internet, and then they show uh, up at your own like, house. Oh my gosh! Wow. I, I bought a new set so of nice. knives, and I was like, "Yes, past me. I need a these." <laughs> <laughs> Who did this? Right. I like these. <laughs> I know. That's exactly what's been helping me. Oh, that's great. Um, 
So yeah, because I will stay in the house all day unless I feel cute, and then I'm like, well, somebody ought to see somebody it. Else see this. Somebody else see this. I did see my it. nails, so yeah. you know, I want someone to compliment these. Yeah, that's great. So that's what's helping this this day on today. On this day, um, what's helping today? Um, I uh, am in New York City right now, and one of the reasons I came down here was that uh, yesterday I met my surgeon. Um, I'm going to be getting top surgery. <gasps> in like five weeks and That's so, so i know and it's been i mean it's been in the works for a long time this kind of thing takes a really long time to get together it's just like insurance fuckery very Ooh. high they're like "Ooh, trans people you know we're gonna right. apply some extra <laughs> scrutiny i mean it's really funny oh, they're very gosh. much like are you a real trans right like, are you, because your social media you're is. saying you don't want boobs but we need lots of backup and i'm like i said i don't want <laughs> boobs to my doctor do you know how hard it was right. to say something like that to my anyway Ugh, it is outrageous i hate that you have to go through that. but yesterday at an 8 a.m appointment in manhattan and i like which just felt very early. But mm-hmm. I, I met this surgeon and I like for months thought I was kind of going with this other doctor and it turned out he'd never done the procedure before, which was really sketchy. And yeah. I was like, oh crap. And so I had to find like someone else. And it was really, I was really afraid that, oh, what if I don't actually like this person or whatever? And then, or, you know, it still might not work out with the insurance, but long story short, I met her yesterday and she was so badass. I was just like, oh, I trust you to do anything. I, I was, I was, I, and it's this so is a big good. thing, but it was like, I really felt it. And I already really, which is during the appointment was kind of so blown away by her. She just had this intense, calm and clear expertise and she just knew what she was doing. Mm. And I just was like, oh my, God. I just felt like my whole life has changed because I happen to be in your office right now. And uh-huh. then toward the end of the appointment, she sort of stood up in this way and I realized she was wearing leather pants. Oh. And my husband and I talked about it afterward and, and we were very much like, did you see the leather pants? <laughs> like we were like, we, we did. We already thought she was so cool. Uh-huh. But then it was like, wow, you're like wearing leather pants at 8 a.m. Yeah. You know, like that's, uh, I love it. Um, yeah. Wow. So that's that's what's helping today. I met my surgeon. And you feel safe with them. And 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 she wears leather pants. And, you know, well, that that's, that's a choice. <laughs> that's a commitment. Yes. What's that like through the day? You know, wow. I feel uncomfortable wearing anything. Let alone. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Tracy, thank you so much for being on Mad Chat today. This was a ball. I had so much fun. I'm very grateful to you for all that you share about yourself. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of your work. I mean, specifically another round, I think, was... Uh, is still my favorite podcast of all time and, and I think that what what you both did in, in a large way was just share yourselves as a way of allowing other people to realize like oh heck I'm not totally alone yeah. with this and that and you know I was one such podcast listener so thank you for Aww. what you do and thank you yeah I'm um I think that's it I think, all right. I think now we just go home and make our Halloween costumes for the Hell next yeah. year. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking about being, but I'm yeah. not sure that I want to broadcast it. This is just like a... Yeah. So I want to be... It's exclusive. Exclusive. I want to be... Well, it'll come out on Halloween, so when it comes out... Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, so, so here's my plan. Okay. <laughs> Will it happen? Tune in next time. I don't know. But um, my we'll favorite... Look at social media. <laughs> social media. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> So my latest Halloween obsession is David S. Pumpkins mm-hmm. from oh, SNL. I, yes. I meant to say at the top, happy David S. Pumpkins season. Thank you. And same to you. Yes. <laughs> same to you. I watch it just about every day. What? I mean, Tom Hanks just being a joy and not being like terrible in a Halloween sketch. <sighs> it's possible. How's it hanging? I'm David Pumpkins. And I'm going to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, I want to be some version of David as Pumpkins. I also want to stay committed to my, you know, people can bear as much as they want and be a sexy version of whatever, at least on this day. Are you saying you're going to be sexy David as Pumpkins? Close. I'm saying I'm going to be Tracy S. Rumpkins. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Exclusive. Mad Chat exclusive. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to work on it. That's great. All right. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Mad Chat is produced by Lee Mengistu. Whenever somebody says to me, hey, Mad Chat sounds amazing, I say to them, hey, thank you. That is 100% not me. That is Lee Mengistu. Um, I met Lee a year ago on the internet. 
and we began the conversation that became this show. I could never have made it without her. Thank you, Lee, for everything, for your ear, for your craftsmanship, for your devotion to this project. She also created our theme song with her sister vocalist, Ruthie Williams. I don't know about you, but our theme song is stuck in my head all the time. A huge thanks to Rachel Charlene Lewis for coming aboard and managing our social media. Please join Rachel online for more conversation about this episode and whatever else. We are at Mad Chat Show on Twitter and on Instagram. Tell us hashtag what's helping today. What's helping you today? And Chris Ritter may illustrate it. Thank you, Chris, for those gorgeous illustrations and the show art and, of course, the Mad Chat logo. Thank you to Alex Kornakia for transcribing our episodes and updating the website with the latest show notes, my recommendations of other things to read and listen to related to this episode. As ever, find all that and information about our guests at madchatshow.com. Thanks today to Justin Wilcox at the wonderful Brooklyn Podcasting Studio. Thanks in general to my pod mothers, Julia Furlan and Eleanor Kagan, and my unpaid intern and husband, Rob Dubbin. I am Sandy Allen, author of A Kind of Miraculous Paradise, a true story about schizophrenia. You can learn about me and my work at hellosandyallen.com. If you've been interested in this podcast, I really think you should check out my book. It's about all this. It's super fun to read. It'll change your whole head. I wrote it because my Uncle Bob made me. It's a whole thing. Learn more about it at akomp.info, acomp.info. Uh, it's a paperback. It's an audiobook that I recorded in part. It's an ebook, and it's now out in French. I would say the title, but I cannot pronounce it. Last, but very much not least, thank you to you, my listeners. I cannot thank you enough for checking out this show and for sticking with us so far. Thanks for your emails and your messages and your lovely posts. Uh, if you love Mad Chat, if you're learning from and feeling fortified by these conversations, I would be very grateful to you if you do whatever you can to spread word. Tell your friends, tell one friend who you think might be particularly interested, or just uh, take a second right now and rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you're listening right now before you move on. All right, I've been making this show entirely independently for its first season. Um, I think I just wanted to prove we could do it, that we could make a show that was about, you know, quote unquote, mental health that wasn't a downer and wasn't ignorant and wasn't stuck in some of the same silos that I've observed these conversations tend to be stuck in. Instead, a show that brings people in and allows them to see the pop culture they're already consuming with more discerning eyes. I want to make a second season of this show, but I will need to figure out another way to fund it. So if you are a podcast network or if you have a big pile of money that you'd like to give me to continue to make this show, you know, uh, get in touch. Send me an email, madchatshow at gmail. Send me a note. Send me a pigeon. All right. I'm going to take some time off, have surgery, and be extremely offline. Keep following Mad Chat on social media, though, especially because you'll be the first to hear about our second season. If you've got thoughts about what we should chat about during season two, send us a note. I'm going to have a lot of time to do nothing with my hands and watch television. This has been the first season of Mad Chat. Thanks for listening. Chat with you again in 2020. Mad Chat. <laughs> Any questions?